I think that philanthropy now means supporting the community, but not just giving money away, giving it away in a manner that creates sustainable organizations that can serve the community, that can make people's lives better. Philanthropy can come in all sorts of forms. It's not necessarily always going to be a gift of money. I think philanthropy is about giving of yourself in a way that leaves those around you better than they were. And it's a process that we can bring the best out in ourselves while we're trying to bring the best out in others. Philanthropy to me is about changing lives and building community. Everyone in our society has an obligation to not only take care of themselves, but to do what they can to help take care of others. Good people doing good things with, with funds. When I think of the word, I think of, you know, some rich guy who's handing out things to those who are less fortunate. But through my experiences with, with Habitat for Humanity and with AmeriCorps, um, I really see philanthropy not so much as a handout as it is a, a hand up. I think it's really about giving from the heart. I think that's philanthropy. Colorado Experience is a co-production of Rocky Mountain PBS and History Colorado. History Colorado brings history to life for audiences of all ages. Through exhibits, collections, and historic preservation programs throughout the state, History Colorado connects people to the stories, places, and heritage of Colorado's past that provide perspectives on today and inspire our choices for tomorrow. Find out more at www.historycolorado.org. Additional funding provided by El Pomar Foundation and the Betcher Foundation, celebrating 75 years of philanthropy in Colorado. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations, and from viewers like you, thank you. We have a legacy of philanthropy in Colorado um, from very early on, but it had to all start somewhere. And it was people in the past though that laid our groundwork, our foundation, what we have. Philanthropy first started in Colorado with Native Americans. They were known for their generosity and often they wouldn't have much, but they would share it. Particularly the Arapaho and the Cheyenne and the Ute here in Colorado. It's when the gold rush uh, begins in 1858 with the discovery of gold in the South Platte River. That summer, Little Raven and the Arapaho had camped here for decades. This was always their favorite campsite at the confluence of Cherry Creek and the South Platte River. But then they would head out in the summers to hunt buffalo on the plains, then head up to the mountain parks to hunt buffalo until about October or when it starts to get cold. Then they would come down to camp at the base of the Rockies at places like Denver and Fort Collins and Boulder and Colorado Springs. And when they come back down in the late fall of 1858, they're in for quite a surprise. Here is Denver City with a few hundred people camped on their favorite campground. But Little Raven realizes it's not gonna to work to fight these people, so he welcomes them with open arms and says, we'll share what little water there is in Cherry Creek in the South Platte. There aren't many cottonwoods here. There's not much grass for all of our ponies, but we'll share it. The Ute Indians rescued a Fremont expedition stranded in the snow in the San Juans in the 1840s. So there's been a tradition of people, you know, giving and helping one another out here in the West. The earliest philanthropy that I'm aware of is back during the gold rush when some folks realized there were people in need who hadn't struck it rich yet. And actually the wife of the founder of the Rocky Mountain News, Elizabeth Byers, 
was apparently the first person to set up a philanthropy. William Newton Byers, everyone's heard of, the founder of the Rocky Mountain News, Colorado's greatest promoter, his greatest booster, through his newspaper, the Rocky Mountain News, which even claimed that we were a seaport that had steamboats sailing down the Platte River. A lot of people read pamphlets back east saying all you had to do is come out west, um, just buy supplies from us, and then you can pick up the gold nuggets off the ground. Or you could just take a wheelbarrow, park it in the river, and be full of gold nuggets in two hours. So a lot of people loaded up their families into wagons and came out here, and they're destitute. They have no food, no supplies. So Elizabeth Byers becomes concerned about this and launches the Ladies Union Aid Society. They're soliciting donations to help out these down and out families here in the gold rush. And she teamed up with some other women. One of them was Governor Evans' wife, Margaret and they really focused on people who were down on their luck. She also collected seed money to start our er earliest churches here in Denver in the early 1860s. When they were building the Capitol, they came to her and said, uh, you know, we know what you've done and how little recognized it is. Would you like to be in stained glass in the Colorado State Capitol? And she looked at this committee and said, you know, my husband, William Newton Byers, is already there in one of those round windows in the dome. And she said, I think that's enough for one family. And yet she added kind of wistfully, still, we women were here at the very beginning, and we helped out, and we did a lot too. And uh, it's a shame that we are only remembered in the reflected glory of our husbands. Mrs. Ella Vincent, she was the wife of Trinity Methodist Church. She and some of her lady friends are realizing there are a lot of widows whose husbands have been killed in the mining industry, which is very dangerous. In America at this time, if you were elderly and you didn't have money you saved up for retirement or family to live with, generally you'd be found frozen or starved to death in America's alleys. Well, this concerns um, Ella Vincent and the other church ladies, so they decide to have a big dinner for all the little old lady widows in Denver on Christmas Day in 1872. It was a huge success. These widows were so thankful. The following year, these church ladies get together, led by Mrs. Ella Vincent, to organize the Ladies Relief Society. And they found the old ladies' home to take care of all these widows, all the unmarried women. Another thing the Ladies Relief Society became very concerned about was the plight of the soiled doves, brides of the multitude, fallen angels on Market Street. At this time in the 1880s, in a three block area of Market Street, we had 1,100 prostitutes, 17 opium dens. Denver was a cesspool of wickedness of the West. And how can we get these girls away from the madams and the pimps down there? Well, in 1884, they launched the Industrial Home for Working Women. This is for the soiled doves, the fallen angels. They could flee to here. They could get them off drugs and alcohol, protect them from the madams and pimps, and get them on the straight and narrow life. The Ladies Relief Society, they would solicit through their husbands, different businesses, and get donations. And of course, women have a way throughout history. They can always put pressure on husband. You know, really, you don't want to help these little old ladies? Or, why don't you want to help these soil dust? You don't know any of them, do you? Now, it's fairly easy to be a woman philanthropist, you know, if your family has means, you know, to take up your spare time. But our great example of working class nobility is Aunt Clara Brown. One of the most generous souls of all. She was a former slave. I grew up in the South where she taught herself to read and taught herself to read the Bible. She was a very devout woman and her owner gave her her freedom. He was so impressed with her. Of course, what are you going to do? You're nearly 60 years old, but then she hears about the gold rush going on in 1859. Well, she approaches a wagon train of Teamsters, 25 freighters, and asks them if they would take her to the Colorado Gold Rush. They said, okay, if you wash our clothes and cook our meals for all 25 of us, you can come along with us to Colorado. And so she did for 25 men. But since she was African-American, she had to walk the 600 miles. She gets to Denver in around 1860, 61, when Central City is booming. And so she joins the hordes headed up to Central City. And there, Aunt Clara Brown makes her living the hardest possible way, washing the red flannel long underwear of these miners. As you know, men by themselves would never bother to wash their clothes. Should I describe the filth, the vermin, the body fluids, the smell, the state of these long johns? She charged 50 cents for an article of clothing, but she knew what they were doing. They were always out there panting for gold. And so she would save all the water in the sand and her wash basin and had a little sluice box behind her laundry. And she'd run it through and extract gold. She saves that money and helps build the 
St. James Methodist Church, a great landmark in Central City to this day. And to their credit, St. James puts on there a plaque saying, Aunt Clara Brown helped to build this. She also saved them enough money to build some real estate up in Central City and then takes it upon herself to go back south to try to find her husband and her children. Well, she only could find some extended family newly freed from slavery, but she'll bring 26 of them back to Colorado. And of course, this time, no one walked. Everyone had a wagon to ride in. Spends her life in uh, doing good work for the church and also uh, the kindergartens and dies and is honored the first woman and the first black to be admitted to the Pioneer Society. And there's a, quite a big ceremony for her when she's buried at Riverside Cemetery as a big-hearted, generous giver. Starting in the 1870s and onward, we have a lot of people coming to Colorado for the climate cure, suffering from tuberculosis. Doctors would tell these sufferers to come out to Colorado, the dry, high climate will cure your tuberculosis. A lot of people, they just had enough money for a one-way train ticket. They arrived at Union Station, thought they'd be cured, and they'd fall off the steps of the train on their faces. In 1878, Hebrew Ladies Relief Society will be established, and they will solicit donations to provide medicine, blankets, and care for these people. A person who became very active in this is Francis Weisbart Jacobs. The very poor in Denver lived in tar paper like shacks down along the South Platte River, and she would go down these hovels and dispense food and clothing to children. But Francis Weisbart Jacobs was one of the people who founded what's now the United Way. It was called the community chest originally, and the idea was that instead of having all these different people coming, knocking on your door, say, I need money for this hospital, I need money for this humane society, I need money for this orphanage, that all of those would consolidate into one organized group that would take in all the legitimate charities. And the other idea was to, to get rid of all the bogus, phony charities and all the people that were asking money for such and such a cause and keeping it for themselves that were scamming people. It started, as I understand it, by a woman, a rabbi, two priests and two ministers who thought there could be a better way. And it has now evolved, obviously, uh, into a really robust workplace giving program. And I think last year, Mile High United Way raised $37 million from the community to give out to nonprofits and people in need. In the 1890s, Harry Tammons is a saloon keeper here in Denver. And the Denver Tribune newspaper went bankrupt. Well, he contacts a friend of his, a con man named Frederick Bonfies in Kansas City. Bonfies comes here with Tammons and they buy the defunct newspaper, rename it the Denver Post. And within a few years, they're in a rivalry with the Rocky Mountain News. By 1901, they surpassed the circulation of the Rocky Mountain News. The way Bonfi is able to do this, put a lot of ink on the front page, but also put the most lurid murder or rape you can find in a Mile High City on the front page. And if they didn't have all the details, they made him up. He was despised by his employees. They claimed that he painted his ankles blue so he didn't have to buy his socks. He was so cheap. There was even a rumor that went around that when he died, that his daughters, Helen and Mae Bonfies, they had to offer college scholarships to get pallbearers to carry his coffin to his resting place. But his daughters, Mae and Helen Bonfies, wonderful people they are. Helen Bonfies takes on the Denver Post and makes it really a premier newspaper. A hundred million dollars or more go into the uh, foundation setup, which Helen Bonfies uh, manages. And she does a lot of good with that. She builds Holy Ghost Church, a beautiful downtown church, supposedly to get her father into heaven. Then Don Sewell takes over, builds the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, with the Bonfies Theater as the anchor and the first building in that center. But uh, Helen Bonfies' philanthropy extended to the Dumb Friends League. She was a great lover of pets and of animals. And practically anywhere you go, you're going to find a Bonfies blood bank, a Bonfies this, a Bonfies that. May Bonfies becomes a great philanthropist. She will team up with Agnes Tammons, the widow of Bonfies' partner, and they will launch a children's hospital. They will end up giving half their family's fortune back to the people of Denver. Some people say the reason why the daughters gave half the family fortune back to the people of Denver, they were trying to buy their dad's way into heaven. Other people said there was not enough money in Denver to buy Bonfies' way in heaven. And to this day, he still floats in purgatory somewhere. For entertainment for saloon goers in early Denver was to watch the incoming stages. June of 1864, it's a hot, dusty day. In comes the stage from Santa Fe. 
Well, the saloon goers, ne'er do wells, miscreants, whatever, they come out. Okay, who's coming on stage today? Well, these three women jump off. Now, they're wearing head to toe clothing, and their heads are covered, and they're all a dusty beige. And the saloon goes, what, what's with these ladies? Then the ladies get out and they start brushing themselves off, revealing black habits of nuns. This will be the first order of nuns to arrive in Denver, the Sisters of Loretto. Within two weeks, they would launch St. Mary's Academy here in Denver. And yes, everyone sent their children to St. Mary's Academy. It did not matter if you were Roman Catholic, Protestant, what have you. And also, of course, you were supposed to pay, but they had a rate. If you could not pay, your children would still go there. Mother Superior Bonfils wanted a school for higher learning for Roman Catholic girls. And in 1890, she scouted around, found a desirable piece of land in southwest Denver, and launched Loretta Heights. In 1918, though, they expanded their operation of the Sisters of Loretto to make it the first Roman Catholic girls college in the Rocky Mountain West. Frances Xavier Cabrini was an Italian immigrant that came over to America and devoted herself for helping people, working classes, in urban slums across America. She launched the Sisters of the Sacred Heart Order of Nuns. In 1905, she came to Denver and launched Queen of Heaven Orphanage on Federal Boulevard. But then it was very hot in the summer, and Mother Cabrini, you know, she looks to the west and sees the blue shimmering mountains. She goes, those orphans shouldn't be sweltering down here. We need to retreat from there in the mountains there. So she starts looking for some land. Some donors generously offer her a track of land on the hogback. Everyone told Mother Cabrini, no, Mother Cabrini, don't take that. Everyone knows there's no water on the hogback on the entire front range here in Colorado. Well, Mother Cabrini took the deed, went up there, said a prayer, turned around, says dig there, and hits the only spring on the entire front range. Of course, today we got the Mother Cabrini Shrine up there. Also, Mother Cabrini will be the first American canonized as a saint. J.K. Mullen was an Irish immigrant and had no work and actually went to work for free because he really wanted a job and amazingly became one of the most successful businessmen in Colorado at the time. He was a poor Irish immigrant who came here, went to Mr. Davis, the owner of the leading flour mill in town, and said, Mr. Davis, I need work. I had a little work back in Ireland. I knew how to do milling, and back in New York where my family lived, I did some. Do you have any work? Davis looked at him and said, beat it, son. I don't have any work. I can't afford to hire you. And little Johnny Mullen looked up at him and said, well, I didn't want any pay. I just want to work for the experience. And Davis is taken aback and says, okay, uh, would you clean up the mill ditches? And especially in the winter, we have trouble, the ice freezes and the water can't flow into my mill down here in our area. And so little Johnny Kearney Mullen goes out to break up those ditches, pretty tough winter work, and does anything that needs to be done. Impresses Davis, rises in the empire, comes to own Davis Milling, then sets up his own Hungarian flour mill, founds the Colorado Milling and Elevator, uh, trying to make Denver into the Minneapolis of the Rockies. He'll have 91 flour mills in seven different states and make a fortune at this. He will end up generously donating money for different organizations. The Mullen School, originally a school for poor orphans, founded by John Kern Mullen. The Mullen Home for the Aged, one of the oldest and uh, longest waiting list places to get into when you get to old age. The Immaculate Conception Cathedral, he's the principal donor. The Statuary and Civic Center Park was donated by John Kern and Mullen. And he also did a lot of anonymous charity. In 1872, Winfield Scott Stratton came out from Indiana to Colorado Springs. He was a journeyman carpenter, but what he wanted to do was find riches in the mountains. He's going to start prospecting in the summer times and then doing carpentry work in the wintertime to support himself. On Independence Day, 1891, he will discover the Independence Mine. The mine will soon end up generating just several million dollars a year. He'll sell it out for cash in 1899 for 15 million dollars. Stratton publicly, though, kind of poo-pawed organized religion and charity. On the outward, he's pretty much endorsing social Darwinism. The only reason you are not wealthy in America is either a drunk or you're stupid or you're lazy, or a combination of these three. He will secretly donate money to build all the churches in Cripple Creek and in Victor. But he told a clergyman, all right, if you tell anybody where you got this money from, you're cut off. Also, so none of these miners and their families would go hungry or cold on Christmas, 
Christmas Eve, everyone got a knock on their door and we hand delivered a bag of coal and a Christmas ham. Stratton did a lot for Colorado Springs. He ended up building an electric trolley car system that went to all reaches of the city. So the working class, the poor, would have access to this. And Myron Stratton for Home, the Carl School of Deaf and Blind, got a huge endowment for Stratton. And when he passed away, he only left a pittance of his fortune, though, to his son. He thought his son never would amount to much, was a ne'er-do-well, and so he only got a few thousand dollars, and the rest went to helping the poor and the needy. There was definitely an early trend for the wealthy, successful business people to create foundations as a way to share their wealth, give back to the community. Later, the community foundation trend really took off. I mean, even though the Denver Foundation started early on, the community foundations really didn't cover the state the way they do now. And so over the years, more and more of them have formed in various parts, uh, various regions. The ski industry has actually played quite a role. Telluride Foundation, Aspen Community Foundation, the Yampa Valley Community Foundation, which is in Steamboat Springs, have all benefited from either the ski area donating money or allowing their ski pass sales to fund the community foundations. That also happens up in Breckenridge. And we now have community foundations serving Greeley and Fort Collins and down in Pueblo and Durango. And they're really a way for people who might not be able to form their own foundation to go ahead and have some role in philanthropy. We're not exactly sure what the first foundation was formed right here in Colorado, but the Denver Foundation is definitely one of the first. It was started in 1925 and it's what's known as a community foundation. And that is an organization that pulls money from people often of modest means so that they can make contributions and grants to nonprofits and support the community in much the same way as some of the private foundations which were started by wealthy business tycoons, folks like the Penroses who started El Pomar Foundation, and the Betchers who started the Betcher Foundation. And those are two of our earliest foundations that have really been investing in projects and nonprofits around the state since 1937. A.V. Hunter, a Leadville banker and a mining man set up the Hunter Trust, which is one of the oldest. A.V. Hunter Trust is another early private foundation was started with banking money. And it's based here in Denver. It, invests all over the state in nonprofits that do all sorts of things. It's very generally focused, and that's what's really interesting about foundations in Colorado. They say if you know one foundation, you know one foundation, because they all really take whatever approach it is typically that their donor wanted them to take, or the original person who set up the foundation left very specific directions. In other cases, that doesn't happen. Uh, Temple Hoyne Buell is one of the foundation creators. He was an architect. He designed things like the Paramount Theater and a lot of the schools. And he didn't leave specific instructions, so the people who now run the foundation have really studied the needs of the state and have decided to focus on early childhood, things like preschool and literacy. And El Pomar will focus on the waterfront, really anything that people out in the community see as a real need. The biggest foundations are uh, Bill Daniels, the great telecommunications magnate, sets up what's now the largest foundation of all. When Bill Daniels passed away in 2000, he left his estate to start the Daniels Fund. The Daniels Fund started with a billion dollars, and in the short time it's been around, has given away $500 million to scholarships and nonprofits all over the state. But it still has $1.4 billion left. Some people might say, you know, you have all this money, why don't you give it out immediately to meet the needs? But foundations like to call this the power of endowment. They like the idea that they will be around for years to come, hopefully forever, to meet the needs of the community. Colorado is extremely generous. In the Rocky Mountain region, Colorado is by far and away the biggest funder of nonprofits from a foundation perspective. About Almost $700 million a year goes from Colorado foundations into the nonprofit sector here. What's really important to note, though, is that individuals, residents of Colorado who don't have foundations, are actually responsible for most of the philanthropy every year. $3 billion a year goes 
from individuals as donations to nonprofits every year. So it's even bigger than the foundation sector. Many people today, they believe that people are jaded, that this society you know, is cruel and heartless. It's always been a cruel, heartless world. I mean, yes, we have examples in the past of philanthropy, but we have so many organizations today, secular, religious, that are coming together to address needs of our society, and it has really blossomed out. We are doing so much better than we were doing in the past. It'll be interesting to see where philanthropy goes because apparently a lot of the younger generations have different ideas about how they want to do things. You know, some people are looking at donor advised funds, others really like the idea of having a multi-generational family foundation, still forming traditional foundations or, or just doing it you know, the old fashioned way of writing a check. We really don't know where it's going to go but it seems to just continue to grow. I imagine that as long as there are needs that need to be filled in the community, that people are going to continue stepping up to fill them. Something we can learn from, well, the philanthropists, the givers of the past, it doesn't always just have to be wealth, but also of your time. Each and every one of us, you could volunteer at your local school, or work within your church, or raising um, clothing or school supplies for children in Afghanistan. I mean, this altruism, this is a common thread that runs through all of us and helps us complete us as human beings. Colorado Experience is a co-production of Rocky Mountain PBS and History Colorado. History Colorado brings history to life for audiences of all ages. Through exhibits, collections, and historic preservation programs throughout the state, History Colorado connects people to the stories, places, and heritage of Colorado's past that provide perspectives on today and inspire our choices for tomorrow. Find out more at www.historycolorado.org. Additional funding provided by El Pomar Foundation and the Betcher Foundation, celebrating 75 years of philanthropy in Colorado. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations, and from viewers like you, thank you. This episode is available on Blu-ray. Visit our website to order. There's more Colorado experience online at rmpbs.org slash Colorado experience.